Would you welcome Josh Revis, everybody? Come on up, Josh. All right. Thank you, Brother Charles. Now, everybody can sing. Us regular human beings can sing. But there's some people who can sing with an A. And Charles Billingsley can sing. Holy smokes, man. Thank you so much. And Brother Jerry, thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight. I do not take it lightly. When I saw the lineup of who he had for these marvelous Mondays, uh, there's a who's who of preachers who he's invited. And to be honest, I'm more of a who's that. And, uh, <laughs> but I snuck in and you're stuck here, so I'm going to go ahead and preach. Now, how many of you, just to go ahead and give me a heads up, how many of you have heard my dad, Herb, preach before? Okay, all right. Okay, okay. He's my favorite too, all right. People ask me all the time, they say, do you preach like your daddy? And I tell them, no, because our people at our church couldn't handle two of that. And uh, so no, so it'll be a little bit different, but we're going to have a good time. If you brought your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open them up to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And if you're a note taker, here's the title of tonight's message. Life's not fair. I told you we were going to have fun. Life's not fair. From Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Jesus is speaking, he's teaching, and he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who've borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful for what we've experienced already this evening. God, we know that you're here. We can sense your presence among us. And God, we're thankful for the worship we've already experienced, for the fellowship that we've had with one another. But God, we've come here tonight because we need to hear from you. And God, you've brought me here tonight to deliver your word. And God, I wanna say what the Bible says. I don't wanna say any more or any less. So God, I pray you'd give me your word for this moment for these people. And that, God, you would change us from the inside out. There are people in this place who are lost. They need to get saved tonight. There's some who are in sin and they need to repent tonight. There's some who are discouraged and they can find that encouragement in you tonight. God, whatever we need, I pray you'd meet us where we are and that you would change us from the inside out. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a little phrase we've all been saying for a long time. That's not fair. That's not fair. Now, we've all said it. Sometimes we say it out loud, sometimes we whisper it, sometimes we say it in jest, sometimes we scream it in anger. And we learned it from the time we were little. You go to the table, it's time to eat dinner, and your mama tells you right up front, there's not going to be any dessert unless you eat all these vegetables. And it's the biggest pile of vegetables you've ever seen in your life. And you say, well, that's not fair. And so you muscle down all the vegetables, and then she gives you the dessert. And you realize the piece of dessert isn't nearly as big as the pile of vegetables. And you say, well, this isn't fair. 
And you grow up and you keep realizing that life's not fair. You get your first job. I remember my first job, I was making about $5 an hour. And I think I worked about 10 hours that week. And I was so excited to get my first paycheck because I'd worked 10 hours and I was making $5 an hour. So I was gonna get $50. And some of you are already laughing because you know what happened. I got my check and it wasn't $50. And I went to my boss and said, I work 10 hours for $5 an hour. I'm no genius, but 10 times five is 50. I said, who are these people called social security and what are they doing with my money? And that's when I learned about taxes. And you know what I said? That's not fair. Right, all throughout life, we have these experiences and we say life's not fair. And listen, there are certainly injustices in this world. There are things that happen that we would look at and go, that is not right. This should not happen. There are abuses. There are things that happen that are evil. But what I'm talking about tonight is this general outlook that we have towards the world so often where we say things that basically amount to this, I'm in last, but I deserve to be in first. I don't like the way things are going and my situation is not fair. Now this story here, it's a parable that Jesus used to teach the people and what he was teaching them was what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. He was teaching them about who God is and who we are and how it is that we can be right with him and how it is that we are called into this kingdom that he's establishing. And here he goes through and he makes it very clear to us and he's going to make it very clear tonight who he is, who we are, how we relate to him and what the relationship between God and man is supposed to look like. Now, before we jump into this, I want to explain what's going on here in this passage of scripture, because as we're reading through this, there's some stuff going on and you may be going, I have no idea what's happening here. There's landowners and managers and denarius and 11th hours and 9th hours, and I don't know what's happening. And so here, I want to give you just a clear picture of what's going on here. It says that there's a master who owns a vineyard and he's going out each day to hire people to work inside of his vineyard. And it says that he goes out in the early hours of that morning, it would have been 6 a.m. And he goes out to what would have amounted to a labor pool, a group of individuals standing around who didn't have jobs, needed jobs. And so he hires them to work. And he says, if you'll come and work in my vineyard today, at the end of the day, I'll pay you a denarius. Now, a denarius is a biblical term. We don't know what the exact amount of money is, but what we do know is that it was equal to an honest day's wage. That if you worked a full day, a full day's work was worth a denarius. Now the value of that would change from year to year, time to time, but it was a general term for an honest day's work. And he says, will you agree with me that if you work the whole day, I'll pay you a denarius? And they say, we agree. And they shake on it and the first crew goes into work. Well, it says that the, the master goes out several more times that day, goes out three hours later at 9 a.m. And he finds another group of people standing there and he says, listen, I need more workers. But now that the beginning of the day has already passed, he enters into a different agreement with this group. And he says, if you will come and work in my vineyard for the rest of today, at the end of the day, I'll pay you what's right. And they agree and they go in and begin to work. It says he goes out at noon, hires some more folks, goes out again at 3 p.m., hires another group, says, I'll pay you what's right. And then he goes out, it says about the 11th hour, that would be 5 p.m., one hour before closing time. And he hires another group of folks and says, at the end of this hour, I'll pay you what's right. They go in and they work says that at the end of the day at 6 p.m. he goes to his steward, the man who manages his vineyard, and he says, I want you to get all the workers together and I want you to pay them. But I don't want you to start with the first people that I hired. I want you to start with that last crew that I hired at the very end of the day. And so you can imagine here they all stand in their groups. You've got the 6 a.m. crew. They've been working all day. You got the 9 a.m. folks. Here we've got the noon crew. We've got the 3 p.m. And all the way down here at the end, we got the 5 p.m. folks who only worked one hour. So he calls up the group that worked that 11th hour on and to their shock and amazement, when they hold out their hand, the steward puts a full denarius in their hand, an entire day's wage for one hour of work. Now we know what starts happening because of verse 10. 
It says that the group in the 6 a.m. crew, their internal cash registers start turning. They've got dollar signs flipping on their eyeballs. All they can start thinking is, wait a minute, he told us he was going to pay us a denarius. They only worked one hour. If he paid them a denarius for one hour, how much is he going to pay us? Five times more? Ten times more? There's no telling what we're going to get. But then their excitement starts to dwindle because the 3 p.m. crew, they get a full denarius. And the noon folks, they get a full denarius. The 9 a.m. crew get a denarius. And by the time it gets down to the 6 a.m. crew, they put out their hand. They are horrified and angry to receive a denarius. And it says that by the time it gets to them, they are so mad that they begin to complain against the landowner. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're like, Brother Jerry, I like this guy. He's chewed up 12 verses of scripture and we've barely gotten started. (laughs) But I just want to give you a heads up. This is where we throttle back. Because in response to their anger, In response to their dissatisfaction, you find there in the last few verses that the master asks the workers three questions. And in these three questions, we get a clear picture of who God is, who we are, and how we're supposed to relate to him. You see the first question down there around verse 13 says, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Here it is. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Did you not agree with me? Here's the first truth we need to understand tonight. God keeps his word. God keeps his word. He says, did you not agree with me? Now they're upset. And to be honest, understandably upset by the pay disparity. Now, we could sit here tonight and act all holy and go, well, they should just be thankful that they got anything. But if it had been any of us, especially some Baptist folk, we'd have something to say about it. I know this is true because we've all been in this situation where you feel like you've done more than your fair share and yet somebody else benefits off your hard work. Do we have any school teachers in the room tonight? School teachers, I'm going to ask all the school teachers in the room to do something for the rest of us. This is on behalf of everyone ever. Please stop with the group projects, okay? Just no more group projects. Nobody likes them. They're not helping any of us. Nobody wants to do it. And here's why. Because in every group project, there's four people. And it's always four. I don't know why it's always four, but you pick four people. Now, there's always a chief who has already assigned themselves the chief. Their personality type is AAA plus plus plus. Before she's even assigned the topic, they've chosen the topic. They know what's going to happen, who's going to have what responsibility, when the meetings are going to be, and how these things are going to be outlined. And then you have two other people in the group, and they're, if you got one chief, they're, they're, they're good soldiers, good Indians, and they're going to do what you ask them to do. I may not do much of the planning, but I'll do my part. I'll show up when I'm supposed to be there. I may be late a couple times, but but I'm going to be there. And then there's a fourth person. And if you don't know who the fourth person is, you're the fourth person. And this is the joker that shows up, never, sleeps through class, doesn't come to any of the meetings, doesn't do their part. Person number one has to pick up all their slack, but they're for sure going to show up on the day the project's due and ask one important question. Did you put my name on it? Did you put my name on it? And you go, well, that's not fair, right? I remember when I was in seminary, I was single at the time. And so me and my friends, man, we were, we were poor and single. So we ate a lot of Little Caesars pizza. That's what the Lord... The Lord created Little Caesars for single college students and seminary students. Said, uh, when we get together and want to eat, you, you didn't just go out willy nilly when you don't have a bunch of money and just buy however many pizzas. You got to do some pizza math. <laughs> so, what you got to do, you got to figure out how much pizza everybody's going to eat. So, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm person number one in the group project. So, I always took charge of this process. So, I'd go around the room. I'd say, Brother Jerry, how? Are you hungry? And you go, man, man, you know, I skipped lunch today. I'm pretty hungry. Well, how many pieces you want? He said, I think I can eat about four pieces. I say, all right. Jerry wants four pieces. I go, Shannon, what about you? How you, how you feeling? He said, well, I had a pretty big lunch, ate late. I think I can eat about two pieces. Okay. Shannon wants two. 
And then I don't mean to stereotype, but I'm going to right now. (laughs) There's always one in every group, and it's usually a lady. And we'll just call her Sally. If you're hearing your name Sally, nobody told me anything about you. It's just, it's just, and here it is. And you go, Sally, how hungry are you? And Sally's going to go, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I don't really eat. Um, I'm on a new diet. I'm an airitarian. I eat air. I just breathe and I don't eat food anymore. So I'm not even going to eat a piece. I'm going to eat like a piece of a piece. Actually, what I'm probably going to do is just get a pepperoni off somebody else's piece. But... Okay, Sally, one piece. And so then I get out my calculator. I divide it up. Here's how many pieces we need. And I start going around. All right, here's how much four pieces is going to cost you. Here's how much two pieces is going to cost you. Sally, here's how much one piece is going to cost you. And the pizza comes. Everybody's eating and having a good time until we look over and see that Sally's already mowed through four pieces of pizza. (laughs) And she's not coming up for air. Just as fast as she can go. And everybody's going, yo, whoa, Sally, that's not, you didn't pay, that's my pizza. So it was what I'm saying, all that silly, but what what I want you to understand, we understand where these folks are coming from, right? We worked all day. We have broken our backs. We've been here in the heat of the day and you're going to pay them the same day. They didn't work hard enough. You're not being fair. But here's the problem. The master can't be unfair if the master doesn't break his promise. See, the master entered into an agreement and the master in this parable represents God. And we, those who are in the kingdom of God, believers, we are the workers. And he made an agreement, a promise to them. And at the end of this story, even though they didn't like their circumstances, God still kept his promises. And what I find is there are many times in life that we don't like the circumstances of our life. And when we don't like our circumstances, we tend to look at God and say, God, this isn't fair. But the truth is, in the areas of our life where we believe God is not being fair, it's always in an area that he never made us a promise. You say, God, I've been faithful to you, but now here I am and I've gotten a diagnosis I don't feel like I deserve. I've gotten this sickness and I don't think this is right. This isn't fair. But the truth is, friend, nowhere in the Bible does God promise that we won't get sick. You say, well, I've been working hard, I've been serving the Lord, and I lost my job. And I don't think that's fair. But you won't find a place in this Bible where God promises that sometimes we won't have financial hardship. You say that, I raised my kids in church and now they're far from God, but God never promised that there wouldn't be prodigals. We may not like the circumstances, But if God's never made a promise, he can't break that promise. But the truth is this Bible is full of promises that God has kept over and over and over. See, he never promised that you wouldn't get sick, but you know what he did promise? That for the sickness you have that really matters, the sin that's in your heart, 1 John 1, 9 says that if you'll confess that sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And there has never been a person who's prayed that prayer to receive the forgiveness of God, that God has not kept that promise, cleansed that sin, forgiven that soul, and made them whole. He keeps that promise over and over. I know sometimes you didn't get the job you wanted or the promotion you wanted. But you know what? Philippians tells us, Philippians 4.19, that he doesn't give us all that we want, but he supplies all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Folks, has God not been true to his word? Has he not been faithful to his promises to you? You say, well, I've got children who have run out on me. I've got people who have turned their back on me. But you know what God promised you? That he would never leave you and never forsake you. He has been with you every step of the way. So we've got to hit the pause button tonight, right here at the beginning of the sermon. And before we look at God and say, God, you're not fair, we have to look at his word and say, God, You keep your promises. And I may not like my circumstances, but you've been true to your word. So that's the first truth. God keeps his word. 
Now we see the second truth and the second question that he asks. He goes on there in verse 14 and he says, listen, take what's yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as to you. And here's the second question he asks. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Here's the second truth. God's in charge. God's in charge. He's the one who's calling the shots. He says, basically, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what's mine? You see, God's not in debt to anybody. God, do, God only owes us one thing, and that's justice. See, everything in this world belongs to the Lord. Anything that we have, he's given to us on loan. Anything good that we experience is only by the grace of God. Everything is his, and he distributes it as he pleases. But see, inside, we often think, God, I've been a good worker, and I deserve more. You know what I love about these guys in the 6 a.m. crew? They've worked 12 whole hours in a vineyard, and now they are experts on how you should run a vineyard. Isn't that incredible? Unemployed in the morning, business experts in the evening. And they're going, this isn't right. This isn't how you pay people. This isn't how you treat employees. This is not how you should be distributing your funds. And if I was the master, I'd be going, were you unemployed this morning? If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have the denarius I gave you. And so now they've all of a sudden got this little bit of experience and all these opinions. And isn't that like us with the Lord? So well, I've been a Christian for 10 years, Lord, 20 years, 40 years. I've been a Christian for 15 years, 50 years, God. And I'd like to tell the infinite God of the universe how he should be running things. God, I've got some ideas on what you could be doing better because I don't like what you're doing right here. Isn't that silly? And we forget who's in charge and who's been called to work. And see, in God's kingdom, now certainly here, there is a, an application for salvation, and it's a beautiful picture. That you got these folks who come into the kingdom early in the morning, and then you got these folks who come into the kingdom late in the day, and they both get the same measure of grace. And it's this beautiful picture that whether you're here, and you're a five or six year old little boy or girl, and you feel the Lord tugging on your heart, and you know that you're lost and you need to be saved, God can save you this very evening. And the grace that he shows you is available to the person and you're here in the twilight of your life. And you've been far from God your whole life. But tonight, if you would repent and believe the same grace he'd show that little boy or girl, he'll show to you tonight. And you can get saved when you're eight or when you're 80. And the same grace applies all across the board. Now, that's one clear application, but the primary application here is to the church. Because he, these are all folks who've been working in the vineyard. They've already been called into the vineyard. And this kind of stuff happens in church. We forget who's in charge. And in churches, the 6 a.m. crew has very little patience for the 5 p.m. crew. See, you, you just don't come to church and start doing stuff. You, you got to earn your place. There's seniority. There is a pecking order. It is not in the charter, it's not in the constitution or bylaws, but it's written somewhere. And this is what people abide by. And we tend to think the longer I've been here, the more say that I have. And if you've just shown up here, you get at the back of the line and you wait your turn. You say, oh, that's not how to, well, well let's see here. I'm just gonna meddle for a moment. <laughs> You're here, you, you've been singing in the choir for 10 years, 10 years. Can I keep going? <laughs> and you've never gotten a solo. And all you've ever wanted. Now, they didn't tell me to say this. I came, this is not, I didn't run this by anybody. So nobody's telling on you or sending emails. It's the Lord. He's got your number, all right? <laughs> so all I've ever wanted is a solo. All I've ever, 10 years, I've faithfully sung in this choir, come to rehearsal every single week, and nobody will ask me to sing a solo. And she showed up three months ago. Three months ago. She's already gotten a solo. Sweet sir or ma'am, can I tell you something? 
You not getting a solo has nothing to do with how long you've been coming to church here. It has everything to do with the noise that comes out of your mouth. I'm just being, just being honest. Somebody, somebody's got to be the one to tell you. See, here's the problem. Yeah, I don't know if you remember all these singing shows they've got on TV. You have this person that auditions and it sounds like somebody shaking a bag of cats. You ever heard this? And they tell them, no, get out of here. And every time they go out of the room, who's standing there? A shocked family member. <gasps> so I'm just here to tell you what your family won't tell you. You're not getting a solo. You're not getting one. You can be here for a hundred years. You're not getting a solo. Is it? You say, Brother Jerry, I, I've been a member of this church for 15 years and I haven't been asked to be a deacon. Why hasn't anyone nominated me to be a deacon? That guy's only been here for two years and they already ordained him as a deacon. Well, you don't give, you complain a lot and you only come once a month. Ooh, I, I don't know, what do you want? <laughs> well, you want to know. Listen, there's no seniority in the kingdom of God. The gifts, the talents, the opportunities, the ministry, they're all his and he's destroyed. We have to remember, folks, this is his vineyard, not ours. This is his church, not ours. And here's the thing. We shouldn't be offended by what we didn't get to do and be in shock and amazement every single day that we get to be a part of this thing he calls his church at all. That he knows us better than anybody knows us, loves us more than anybody could love us, and uses us in spite of ourselves, should drop our jaw every single day. And so whether he's got you cleaning restrooms, preaching the sermon, changing the diapers, greeting at the door, whatever it is, you do it to the glory of God and say, God, if you want me in this post for the next hundred years, I'll do it for your glory because you're in charge and I'm not. This is your church and not mine and you know what to do with your stuff so God keeps his word and God's in charge but here's the third one and it's so beautiful God is generous God's so generous look at the end of verse 15 it's the third question he says or is your eye evil because I'm good you say what on earth does that mean some of your translations say do, do you begrudge my generosity Here's basically what, what it's saying. Are you mad because I was so good to them? Are, are you mad because I was good to them? Are you mad because I was generous? And again, we can sit and be holy and go, oh, I would never. But are we happy with what God's given us until we perceive that he's given somebody else something better? See, we're happy with what we got as long as it's better than what everybody else got. <laughs> you ever tried to give four kids four pieces of cake? Kids aren't good at math until they're measuring the size of a piece of cake, are they? His is four millimeters bigger than mine. Why did he get the big piece? See, you needed a car and God gave you a car and you've loved that car till your brother-in-law got a new truck. You say, God, you got me driving around here like a savage in cloth seats. How am I supposed to faithfully serving you and I'm living like a pauper? Man, you loved your house till your sister got a new house. And you go, God, you've got me living in this shanty. She's got two and a half bathrooms. I've only got two bathrooms. How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to live? Because we're wired for jealousy. We're wired to be ungrateful. We're wired to want more. This is why the internet's such a terrible place. Terrible. Social media is the worst. Facebook. Oof. Facebook. Any of you on Facebook? Some of you? Okay, a lot of. Now, some of you, if you're like a face what? Uh huh. If you're not on Facebook, just count yourself among the blessed and highly favored and never go near that place. You'll be happy. But just so, in, in case you don't know, Facebook is where everybody goes to lie. That's what, this is what everybody goes to lie about how great their life is. This is what happens. 
Now get on there and you're scrolling through your Facebook and there's a picture of the Joneses and they went on their beach vacation and there they all stand in their white shirts and their khaki pants and a sand dune and they're all smiling and you go, look at the Joneses going on their beach vacation. I wish I could go on a vacation like that. But you know what they didn't post? The 3,462 bad pictures. All the ones it took to get the one good picture. They didn't post the picture of mom yelling at dad because he showed up with black pants instead of khaki pants and she had to send them to Old Navy to get the right pants. And they didn't post mom yelling at the kids because they're running in the sand dudes because heaven forbid you took them to the beach and expected them not to run for the water. They didn't post grandma going, all I've ever wanted is one good picture of this family. No, just one smiling picture to make you jealous. Some of you got friends, they, they pose these statuses that make you want to scream. It's a picture. It's a picture of their kids reading. <laughs> Books. And here's the caption. How do you get them to stop reading? How do I get them to put down the books? And you're going, I have no idea. Because I can't keep mine from punching each other in the face. We can't. Kids singing in the morning. Is there anything sweeter than the sound of little voices praising the Lord in the morning? Beats me, bud. I don't know. I got three grizzly bears in here. I'm dragging out of the bed every morning and throwing on the bus. Here's the one that's going to make some of you ladies lose your mind. It's, you know, picture of her sweet husband. Oh, that was my sweet man. Can't even keep anything on my honeydew list. What am I going to do with him? And you're going, could you send him to my house? Because I got a lump of flesh in this recliner over here, and he hadn't touched anything on the list for four years. That's where I'm at. And church doesn't help. You come to church Sunday morning, and every church has one, and don't point at them perfect family show up in their car it's washed they're early it's the Stepford family get all their kids out they're all in matching outfits got their hair all neat everyone's smiling and here you come in on two wheels in your minivan like a rambling band of gypsies you're 15 minutes late, they're hopping out of the car, you're going, why aren't you wearing shoes? <laughs> you're cramming cereal bars in everybody's mouth, going, you are going to act like you're happy because I am not going to let the preacher know that we are not a happy, God-loving family. <laughs> and you're walking in, and your husband and wife, and, and she's looking at the step for Fanny, go, do you see how he's helping her? Do you see how he's helping her? I wish you would help me like that. And he's going, do you see how she's not yelling at him? I would help you more if you yelled at me less, right? And so we can start looking at Facebook and we can start looking at other people in church and we can start looking at other people's stuff and go, I, I don't deserve this house. I deserve that house. I don't deserve this truck. I deserve that truck. I don't deserve this job. I deserve that job. I don't, I don't deserve these kids. I, just, <laughs> I deserve those kids. I'll trade you. <laughs> and here's the problem. When we think that way, we in error think the problem's out there when the problem's right in here. See, it's a contentment issue. It's if I had more, if I had an extra half bath or if I had the boat or if I had an extra week of vacation, if I had 10,000 more, more dollars a year on my job, then I'd be happy. But the truth is there's no amount of stuff that's going to make you happy. And the honest truth is if you stop for a moment and quit focusing on everything you don't have and started paying attention to all God's done, there'd be a radical shift in focus because listen, God's been far beyond gracious with us. See, God's generous. See, verse 16 right there, so the last will be first and the first will be last. That's not some sort of holy math equation that we have to crack. So well, the first are going to be last and the last are going to be first. Well, I don't want to be in last and I need to get in first. But if I try to be in first, then I'm going to get in last. So I need to get down here. That's not, that's not how this works. What it's doing, is it's communicating this truth that the kingdom of heaven is not like the world. 
And the last are going to be in first because they know that they should be in last. And the first are going to be last because they foolishly think that they should be in first. See, the question tonight, and this is where we'll close. See, we're all saying the same thing. We're just saying it in two different ways. And it all depends on what lenses you're using to view the world. See, I wear these glasses and these glasses change the way I see everything. When I don't have them on, everything's a blur. And when I put them on, it just changes. I can see all your beautiful faces. And there's two kind of glasses that everybody's wearing. You're wearing one or the other. The first are the glasses of fairness. You see, everybody who wears the glasses of fairness, all you can see is what you don't have. All you can see is what you should have gotten. And you look around and you go, God, I, I don't deserve, you know, I, I deserve a better house and I deserve a better marriage and I deserve better kids and I deserve a better job and I deserve this and I deserve that. And God, all you've given me here and all you're holding out on me, you say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. But for those who have been to the cross, God gives you a new set of glasses and they're the glasses of grace. And once you've been to the cross and you realize who God is and who we are and what we deserve, you start going, you would love me? You, wait, you would save me? You would give your son to die in my place? You'll forgive all these sins? You would put a roof over my head? Food on my table? Give me this family to love, this church to serve in? And it's the same phrase, but it sounds a whole lot different. And you go, God, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve any of this. See, hasn't God kept his word? Hasn't he been in control? Hasn't he been generous to you? And so I would ask you tonight, what's the tone of your heart? What's the tone of your heart? Tonight, do you sit here and say, I don't deserve this. I deserve so much better. Or do you stand here tonight and go, oh, I know what I deserve. And I sure don't deserve what God's given me. I sure don't deserve what God's given me. Here's the reality, folks. We shouldn't be interested one bit in God being fair. Because if God was fair, we'd all be toast. <laughs> we'd be toast. Because if he was fair, we'd get what we deserve. And what we deserve as sinners is a place called hell. But because God's not fair, now he's just, but he's also gracious. And because he is gracious and merciful, tonight he's taken fair off the table and he's put his grace in its place. And tonight, if you're lost, he'll save you. If you're in sin, he'll forgive you. If you're far from God, he'll welcome you back home. If your life's in shambles, he'll take those pieces. You don't know where to turn, you can turn to him. And he's got a book full of promises here that he will keep for you day after day after day after day. But you'll only be able to see it if you got on those grace glasses. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus is your savior, you've never tasted grace. See, all that excitement you saw earlier, that wasn't people just excited because a choir can sing real good or because Charles could sing real good. That's because we've actually experienced all that was being sung about. We've been lost, but Jesus found us. We've been in sin, but we've been set free. We were dead, but we were raised to life. And it was all because of Jesus. And the only thing that's going to change the way you see this world is for Jesus to give you a new set of glasses. And that's only going to happen if you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing is God won't give you what you deserve. He'll give you grace and he'll give you mercy. And he'll save your soul tonight. So there's some folks in this place in a moment, we're going to stand up and there's going to be ministers standing down here and you could come take any one of them by the hand and say, would you tell me how I could be saved tonight? 
And they'll open up the Bible and they'll explain to you how with a simple prayer of repentance and faith, you can surrender your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior tonight. But I believe on a Monday night in church, there's a bunch of God's people here and you're saved. But all you've been able to see lately is all the stuff you don't have and you've lost sight of all that God's done. And tonight in a moment of humility and repentance, you need to come before God and you need to declare those three truths. God, you keep your word. And God, you're in charge. You're in absolute control. And God, you have been so good and generous to me. And a little time thanking him for all he's done and you'll lose sight real quick of all those things you thought you wanted. And it'll change the way you see everything tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you stand all across this auditorium? Let's stand right now to make it easy for people to move. And as we have this time of singing, if you need someone to pray with you, someone to explain to you how to be saved, you come take one of these ministers by the hand. But if you just need to get along with God and pray, these steps are open here for you. And you can come before a holy God. He'll meet you right where you are. And he'll change everything. God, in these moments, I pray we would be obedient to your call. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you come? He is.